Welcome to Worship This Morning. Today is the second Sunday in Advent and our reflection will be given by Bill Imley from Newport Church of Scotland. Our readings today are all about preparing for the arrival of God's messenger. The prophet Isaiah said, Prepare the way of the Lord, make a path for our God in the desert. Each valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill be laid low. The crooked shall become straight, rough places shall be plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All people shall see it together. The desert will sing and rejoice, and the wilderness blossom with flowers. All will see the Lord's splendour, see the Lord's greatness and power. Tell everyone who is anxious, be strong and don't be afraid. The blind will be able to see, the deaf will be able to hear, the lame will leap and dance, those who can't speak will shout. They will hammer their swords into ploughs, they will turn spears into pruning hooks. The nations will live in peace, no more will they train for war. This is the promise of God. God's promise will be fulfilled. Let us pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for beauty, the twinkle in an older person's eye, a child's shout of laughter. Thank you for frosty gardens and frozen puddles, for stunning buildings and roses in winter. Thank you for beauty. Thank you, God. Thank you for creativity, the skills of a tapestry weaver, the imagination of a website designer. Thank you for bakers and dancers and crossword compilers for spiders' webs and cities' murals. Thank you for creativity. Thank you, God. Thank you for abundance, for seeds and raindrops, for unique snowflakes and infinite galaxies. Thank you for seagulls, plankton and shoals of fish, for wriggling worms and shiny red holly berries. Thank you for abundance. Thank you for your world, God, and our part in it. Thank you that you are a maker and that you made us makers too. Help us to love creation as you love it, to take risks to value it as Jesus did, and draw us into the wildness and wonder of the Holy Spirit, today and every day. Creator of light and darkness, we so often chase shadows and fail to walk in the light, fail to enjoy the life you have given us. Forgive us, O God. May we know that we travel through Advent as forgiven people, remembering to lift our faces towards the light. Let us walk together with you in hope and in faith. And let us now pray together in the words Jesus taught his first disciples, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and for evermore. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, reading from verse 1 to verse 11. Comfort for God's people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass and all of their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Our second reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Way back, when life seemed to be filmed in black and white, I reached the age when I could leave the life boys and join the boys' brigade. I was still in primary school, but there were older boys in the company who had left school altogether and were actually working for a living. One of the staff sergeants had had a medical for national service. He was being called up for two compulsory years in the armed services. He failed this medical, otherwise he would have been in one of the last groups of national servicemen. Being called up seemed to have been a very mixed blessing and many, many stories abound from the time. There was one I remember reading. It was about a young lad who had been drafted into the army. From the very start there was a problem. Every time he was out on the parade ground, he was constantly breaking out of line to chase pieces of paper. He would just run after any piece of paper glued past. He would pick it up, turn it over in his hands, look at it carefully and mutter, no, that's not the one. Now his behaviour was nowhere to be found in the army drill manual. The sergeant shouted and screamed. He was given endless punishments, but still he persisted in chasing bits of paper, reading them and saying, no, that's, that's not the one. Eventually, his company commander sent him to a doctor. The doctor gave him every test under the sun with no conclusive result. He said to the young lad, Truly, I cannot find out what is wrong with you. Equally, however, I can find nothing that proves that you are fit to continue serving in the army. With that, he wrote out the discharge papers. The young lad picked up the paper and said loudly, Yes, 
that's the one. For some young men, taken away forcibly from their normal lives, national service was like a prison sentence. They counted down the days until their release. It was like someone saying, you've done your bit and you have suffered double what you deserved. Just exactly as the prophet Isaiah said in the first reading. The strongest and the best of the inhabitants of Jerusalem had been taken away to exile in Babylon. They were forced into doing hard labour. For the most part, it was digging canals between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Those left behind in Jerusalem were the ones who were either too weak or too old for any work. As a result, the surrounding fields were not farmed, the buildings received little or no maintenance, and the roads were crumbling. These poor people were hungry, exhausted, and they were completely at the mercy of the Babylonian soldiers. They were prisoners in their own country. Then a messenger, messenger appeared with a scroll. It was written by a Jew living in Babylon. Now the messenger had been stopped at several checkpoints. Each time he was able to satisfy the, the guards that the scroll was just a, an old prophecy written hundreds of years before by someone called Isaiah. Nothing subversive at all. However, had they unrolled the scroll completely, they would, find, they would have found another scroll tied on by a piece of string. It was a message full of hope. It predicted that Babylonian power was coming to an end. The exiles were be, to be returning home in the near future. The folk of Jerusalem were overjoyed. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she had received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2. Okay, but was the exile of the best part of the population really a punishment sent by God? In reality, Judah was just a small nation caught in between the two superpowers of the day. But the Judeans themselves believed that the Lord had made a covenant to protect his chosen people. They believed also that to keep their side of the promise, they had to behave and to obey certain commandments. They were now suffering, so they reasoned that somehow they must have broken their side of the bargain. God had washed his hands of them. But now, a message, a message from the prophet, a message which said that they had, they had to learn the importance of keeping the faith at all times. Cyrus was king in Babylon, and he would soon set them free. It is quite wrong to think of God deliberately causing people to suffer. Even if we have got some things wrong, God does not dole out punishment like some vengeful medieval monarch. God takes a personal interest in us. We are never alone or unnoticed. Like many others who have suffered, Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, why, why have you forsaken me? But that was not his final cry. He was still certain in that, in, in that darkest of hours, at the back of all things, there is a God who loves us, a God from whose love nothing can separate us. On that fateful cross, his final prayer was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We have all endured a long, very different and very difficult year. But there is hope now for the future. <coughs> Pardon me. And, and this is Advent. There is a, a joyful message for us all in Advent as we await the coming of the King. In the Gospel reading, 
Jesus tells, John tells us of his coming, reminds us all of the prophecy of Isaiah, the coming of the Prince of Peace, indeed the King of Love, the coming of our great friend who will be with us at all times. As we look towards the, the birth of that long hoped for baby, we can pick up his piece of paper, read his message for us and say from the bottom of our hearts, yes, that's the one. Amen. And to God be the praise and glory. The voice of God is the voice crying out for justice and peace. The voice of God is aching for wholeness. The voice of God invites us to stand for justice, encourages us to feel worthful, helps us to become whole. In stillness, let us seek to become open to the voice of God. Let us pray. God, we come to you in our waiting. We wait with our fears, our anxieties and frustrations, our pains and regrets, our shame and confusion. God, help us to wait in peace. We wait with impatience. We rush around, preparing for the festivities, not leaving space to prepare our hearts. God, Help us to wait in faith. We wait in excitement. We are ready to celebrate. We know the story with its humbleness, simplicity and wonder. God, help us to nurture our joy. We wait in thanksgiving. We are free and able to celebrate. We have others around us to share in the journey. We are able to wonder in the marvel of your gift. God, help us to receive your love. Come, Lord Jesus, into the darkness of our world, a world where there is injustice, racial tension and war. Where many people still lack the basics of food and clean water. Come, Lord Jesus, into the uncertain future of migrants and refugees who risk everything to escape atrocities, yet know that they could still end up paying with their lives. Come, Lord Jesus, into our communities, where many are struggling with redundancy and debt, and food banks have become a lifeline for those in need. Come, Lord Jesus, into the darkness of our cities where greed and discrimination make misery in people's lives. Come, Lord Jesus, into our lives and into the lives of those for whom we are concerned.
bring comfort to the bereaved and to those who are struggling to cope with life on their own. Come Lord Jesus, give reassurance where there is fear and confidence where there is doubt. Wherever people are hurting, come and let your light shine. Amen. As always, it has been a privilege to share worship with you. This week, may we know God's peace, the peace that passes understanding, as we prepare for the coming of the Christ child into our lives once again this Christmas. And now a blessing. We travel in time. May God walk with us into eternity. We travel in hope. May God sing with us through the darkness. We travel in wonder. May God dance with us in holy joy. And so may the blessing of the God of glory, traveller, storyteller, dancer, be with us today and every day. Amen. <laughs>